Hello, everyone. It's Lisa Ling, and this is The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. If you're joining for the first time, welcome. We are talking live to experts around the globe and taking your questions as we go. In the news yesterday, a company, Moderna, announced that its preliminary tests of its vaccines were safe. A second phase of testing will begin soon, but this is very promising news right now on the road to a vaccine. Now, we've spoken a good deal on the show about how when we get to a su successful vaccine, uh, how, you know, when it, when it proves to be safe and effective, how can a company produce enough to effectively combat COVID-19 globally? Johnson & Johnson's goal is to develop a vaccine with the aim of manufacturing 1 billion doses, uh, which is as big a commitment as we've heard in terms of scale. But as large as 1 billion doses sounds, there are 7.8 billion people around the world. And in order to achieve herd uh, immunity, which is the goal, 70% uh, of the population must have gotten infected with the virus or been vaccinated. So how do we get there? Today, we'll be talking about how we as a global society can get enough vaccines and get them distributed fairly. We'll talk to Jane Halton, chair of the board of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and why Australia has been praised for how well they've handled the outbreak and how they plan to get vaccines to remote populations. And when you're trying to get something from point A to point B, you call on the people who know how to do that. Laura Lane from UPS will enlighten us on how they're ramping up to deliver vaccines all over the world. But first, Seema Kumar. She is the Vice President, Innovation, Global Health, and Policy Communications at Johnson & Johnson. Seema has devoted her career to advocating for the sciences, journalism, and public policy, and has been a proponent of championing women and young people in the sciences. And, and I am personally so excited to have Seem on the show because she has just been this incredible expert for me uh, who has been able to break down so many uh, difficult and complex uh, pieces of information uh, in the sciences. So Seema, thank you so much for being with us. I want to ask you first about the news that broke yesterday that one company is showing some promising results in their phase one trial of their vaccines. Now, we know that there are many vaccines that are being developed. Can you talk about the different kinds of vaccines that exist? Yes, uh, thank you, Lisa. Yes, it was really exciting yesterday to see the promising results come out from Moderna. And uh, that is good news for the global society. And as you say, there are many different vaccines that are being developed against COVID. And the WHO actually declared that there are more than 150 different types of vaccines that are being developed. And they generally fall into different categories. They could be live attenuated, which means you take the virus and you weaken it. They could be inactivated virus, or they could be engineered. And in the engineered category, you have vaccines that are made with RNA-based platforms. You have vaccines that are made with DNA-based platforms. And then you have viral vector platforms. And those are where you take a cold virus, you make it non-replicating or inactivated, and put a piece of the spike protein. Now, yesterday's news was great because what it shows is that using a piece of the spike protein does work. So that's good news for all the vaccines uh, that are in development. Asima, you have talked passionately about the importance of transparency, about educating the public and working to demystify science, a goal that seems really so important during this pandemic. And yet over the past several decades, we've really seen this erosion in people's trust in facts. So I saw you refer to all of this as truth decay. So what in your mind is so dangerous and, and are you hopeful that we can combat it and get past it? Yeah, you know, science and technology brings so many different improvements in our lives on an everyday basis from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, we're using science and technology all the time. And yet most people cannot relate to what goes on behind a lab and what scientists are working on day in and day out. And in today's information explosion age, it's very hard to separate fact from fiction. So how do you really engage the public in all of the exciting things that are going on in science and technology? And so part of what we've been championing is the engagement of scientists who speak a certain type of a language with the public who really want to understand this language. And I think both need to talk to each other because 
unless scientists engage in the public, uh, they will not uh, be able to communicate why their science is so valuable and why public investment and public funding of science is so important. And then the public, on the other hand, really needs to understand science and technology because today more than ever, we're finding out how much we need to know and how much we still have to learn about public health, about science, about technology. It impacts our everyday lives. Well, this certainly is a, a unique moment when because of the pandemic, people seem to be so eager to absorb as much information as they can in an understandable way, of course. Now, we've been talking throughout this episode, or we will be talking throughout this episode about cross industry collaboration. So what, if anything, has COVID-19 changed in the way the global community works on scientific problems? And how do you think this pandemic um, might even change science? forever yeah i think that you know collaboration has always been a key part of how we handle science and technology we saw it in the hiv crisis when it took extreme collaboration across scientists and academia industry but also patient advocates and governments and regulatory bodies to really uh you know conquer hiv and make it into something that is a manageable manageable condition nowadays um, however, what we're seeing in the COVID situation is how much more on steroids we need to take this collaboration to. It needs collaboration across the globe, across the scientific community, but also across public and the policymakers, so, and even among competitors. So I think that what we're seeing now is collaboration at just an unprecedented scale, because that's what we need to really get a handle on the pandemic. Absolutely, given its, its global nature. Uh, for those of you who are watching throughout the show, our guests will be answering questions. So if you have any, please write them in the comment section, uh, especially if you have any for Seema Kumar, who is our first guest right now. Now, Seema, you grew up in India, which has a massive population of over a billion people. And having spent a lot of time in India myself, I know that it is just hugely densely populated. How would you say COVID is being handled in India? You know, the COVID um, pandemic is just at the beginning stages in India. So just today, I think we reached about 100,000 cases in India. And so if you think about India's population, 1.3 billion, and if you think about some of the cities, and as we know, cities are typically the hardest hit. Um, think about Mumbai, which is about 25 million in population. That's four times as many people in Mumbai as in New York City in the same amount of space. So if you think about that, I think that the pandemic, there's a huge, huge concern about what it's gonna be like, especially in crowded places like the slums in India. And I think the government has extended the lockdown uh, up through to the end of May. And while it's easing lockdown in places that are rural and where there are fewer cases, uh, in places like Mumbai, the lockdown has been extended. So. We feel in India that the worst is yet to come. Uh, and I think all the measures are being taken. Uh, however, in a place like Mumbai, where it's very crowded, um, I think it's going to, we're going to see some Mumbai become the next epicenter. Getting back to uh, vaccines, Johnson & Johnson's goal is obviously, as we've said, to produce a billion vaccines, but there are billions of people in the world, 7.8 in fact. So. How how are we able to, are we going to be able to get vaccines to this, this this massive population and in an equitable way? Yeah, I think that that's the key question that I think that people uh, all over the world are working towards. Everybody who are the scientific experts, people uh, in manufacturing and supply chain, but also the world community, including the WHO and many other partners are thinking about exactly the same thing. First of all, how do you, the logistics of how you get it across the globe, number one, but number two, how do you do it in an equitable way so that there is access to everybody? And so, you know, there is a commitment, I think, fr from the world community uh, that we have to do this, uh, not only because it's the right thing to do, but it makes sense because that's how we're gonna end this pandemic. Seema Kumar, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I, I'm hoping that 
Um, we can have you on uh, on the show many more times because again, you're so great at explaining things. Actually, we do have a question from Daniel on Facebook uh, and he is wondering what the timeline is for human testing globally. For human testing globally, with respect to Johnson & Johnson, we are going to be starting our clinical trials in September. So September of this year, and we're still on track to do that. Terrific, Seema. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, just Thank in you. case you are tuning in now, I'm Lisa Ling. This is the road to a vaccine efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. Coming up later in the show, we'll talk to Laura Lane from UPS about the role of drones in delivering medical supplies and vaccines. Our next segment, though, is Vaccines 101, where we break down the vaccine process. Once a vaccine is manufactured, there's the job of actually making it. So our guest educator today is Ramo Colaruso from J&J, &J, and he's here to explain uh, uh, the supply chain. Ramo, the head of the supply chain for J&J's Janssen pharmaceutical business. I wonder if you can explain what the supply chain is and how it works. Well, first of all, Lisa, I am just so very excited to be here to talk about not only the manufacturing, but also the end-to-end -end supply chain. Uh, having 30 years experience in pharmaceutical supply chain I can tell you it is a complex process. It requires enormous collaboration. We talked about that before. Uh, and also expertise along that, that, that supply chain. <clears throat> a lot of times we don't think about it. We order a product, it arrives. But there are thousands of people working behind the scenes that actually make that happen. What are they doing? Let me take you through it. First, it starts with planning. How much are we going to make? <clears throat> and then how much of all the materials and things are we going to need in order to make that? That's called planning. That's the first step. After we plan and we know what we need to gather, we then source those materials with suppliers. That's procurement. Um, and in our vaccine, there's over 100 of these materials, everything from glass vials and stoppers and chemicals and things like that. Once you finally get your materials, then you actually manufacture. And the manufacturing process for many vaccines out there are biologic, which means they take time. Uh, our process, for example, takes about 10 weeks between when we start a batch and when we release it for use. Um, and lastly, once you finally have your your, your vaccine manufactured in a glass vial or a syringe, then you actually have to distribute it to the people that need it. So these are the various aspects. It's called a supply chain because we link them together. Uh, and there's your chain. And, um, and, and again, the collaboration along that supply chain are, is what makes that supply chain a success or not, quite frankly. We've been talking about how Johnson & Johnson is committed to manufacturing a billion doses of the vaccine, which is just a monumental undertaking. I, I know it's never been done before. So can you explain how you plan to produce such large quantities of a vaccine? Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, One billion doses is, uh, is a huge task. Uh, uh, but again, we're talking about a situation impacting people so profoundly. Uh, we, we feel a huge responsibility to put out a bold goal like that. And we have a lot of confidence in being able to do that because of a number of things. First, uh, we've been in this space for a number of years, and, and I will say we've been optimizing our process and productivity of that process over the years. Today, we're about five times more productive than we were even five years ago. So inherently, we're getting better at it. Secondly is you still have to have the manufacturing capability. You need buildings, you need equipment. Most importantly, though, you need really smart people that know what they're doing to manufacture the product. Um, and, then, and then lastly, uh, you know, you're going to need to distribute it. Now, the manufacturing piece is, 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 is the way you get to something so large, a billion doses, it's like 30 times more than all of our other products combined, is, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely that one company will have all that capacity sitting around waiting for a pandemic. But it's much more likely that lots of companies might have a piece of it. And, and that's been our approach is we're going to collaborate with, with the best people out there that know what they're doing, and we'll piece this together and get to our billion doses. Uh, great partners, the collaboration, that's what will make this success, and that's how we'll get to the billion doses. Which leads me to my next question. I've talked to so many different people who work for, for J&J all over the world. So where will the vaccine be manufactured and, and how do you leverage your global manufacturing network? 
Yeah, you know, network and the manufacturing network design is, is probably one of the most important things that I do. And honestly, be before we decide where we would manufacture anything, the things that come to mind are, how do you make sure that for products like ours that save lives, that prevent disease, you have that supply continuity, right? I mean, a great example of that is uh, when Hurricane Maria hit in Puerto Rico about you know, 2017, we had plans in place that we could have backups and cover that. And we, did, we were very successful to ensure that supply continuity. You know, similarly, when the COVID-19 uh, crisis started back in January, borders started closing, transportation stopped. Uh, we also invoked those plans, uh, and those plans usually involve backup capacity, right? And so that you could produce from different ways or distribute different ways. Um, so, so I think the first thing is, you know, let's think about supply continuity. Let that philosophy then inform, you know, where we ultimately manufacture. So, so our, our plan is to multiple, you know, to supply from multiple locations across the globe. Uh, and we're going to need that to get to the billion doses. But I also think, you know, it's important that, that we've already signed some deals and we, and, you know, with some partners. So Emergent Biosolutions at Catalent, we signed, we announced that about a month ago. Um, and we are working vigilantly to secure the rest of the, uh, of the pieces that get us to our billion. You know, this will take a village. This is no one company is going to be the hero here. Uh, it's going to require great collaboration with multiple capable partners all over the world to make it happen. And, and the great news is the people I talk with, the companies that I'm interacting with are capable, they're great partners, and I'm optimistic, very optimistic, we'll be able to, to, to achieve our goal and will depend greatly on working with the whole world of suppliers out there. Raymo, I have a question uh, from Lauren from LinkedIn who asks, how are you keep keeping the supply chain safe during the pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's- Raymo, uh, did you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did hear you. Yeah, it's a little choppy with our internet, but um, yeah, supply chain security actually is a very important aspect of your supply chain design. In fact, we have a we we have a, a security uh, a part of our company that looks specifically at that, right? So so the, the the partners that we work with, our own internal facilities go through a very rigorous exam inspection, if you will, uh, where we look at all the the both physical and also cyber security. To ensure that that the uh, integrity of that supply chain is 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 at the utmost uh, competency, and therefore the products that we make in it maintain uh, it, their safety and security of supply to our to our people. We also have a question from Barbara from LinkedIn who asks: the vaccine once the vaccine is produced, how do you prioritize distribu uh, distribution of it? Yeah, no, the prior to, you know, that's a great question, first of all. I think Seema talked a little bit about it. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the distribution, what's really important is that most vaccines, and ours is, is, is a great example of this, require what is known in the, in the distribution networks as cold chain. And right, they, they need to be refrigerated, like milk is, okay, or they need to be frozen, like ice cream, uh, to make it simple. Um, but the interesting thing, the implication of that is, that you need to make sure that it maintains this cold state all the way through from our manufacturing sites to distribution centers to ultimately the place where they will be uh, inoculating uh, uh, people. And that means storage in cold boxes and refrigerators and refrigerated trucks and all of that. So that is a big consideration uh, with respect to the distribution aspects. In terms of the priority, we want to absolutely, absolutely prioritize those people that have or those companies that have a capability of providing that 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 the integrity of the cold chain, uh, and then again with respect to uh, uh, the priority of, of where the product goes, you know that is you know we obviously want to make sure that the vaccine has the biggest impact, you know right from the start, and 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 we are working diligently as a company to figure out exactly you know what that looks like. Such a Herculean undertaking, uh, Ramo Coloruso. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. A reminder to everyone that we are live. Uh, this is the road to a vaccine. I want to encourage all of you questions in the comment section, and we will be answering them throughout the show. So once a vaccine is manufactured, the challenge is getting it to the people who need it the most. Our next guest has led Australia's Department of Health and understands the complexity of delivering health care equitably. 
So I caught up with Jane Halton earlier to discuss their approach and how they plan to get their vaccines to their most vulnerable populations. Jane, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I, I wanna first praise you because Australia has gotten high marks for how it has handled COVID and, and you've played an integral role in this as part of the COVID-19 Coordination Commission in Australia. What would you say your strategy was at the outset and how are things now? So, I mean, I think Australia has always taken a particular interest in issues around pandemic and certainly in the period that I was Secretary of Health. We, in common with other countries, particularly in our region, had the experience of SARS on our doorstep. Of course, we had H5N1 and H1N1. So we've done a lot of work over the years on having stockpiles and having pandemic plans and indeed exercising them. So part of the strategy, I think at the very outset, is basically being alert and a tiny bit alarmed. And that meant that, of course, as we saw things starting to unfold in China, um, that meant that there were people, one, paying attention, two, uh, with a good idea about what they should be doing. And then there's a very well-established and very vigorous public health community in Australia. So not only did uh, all of those people come to the fore and have a vigorous public debate about what we should be doing, but the leadership inside government took decisive action. And of course, the coordination that we've been doing ever since then is looking to, well, deal with the economy because the effects of this are so real for so many people. But importantly, keeping the public health uh, objective of minimising spread identifying people who've actually contracted the disease and then having a health system that's ready to deal with it. All of that is at the fore. You are also the chair of the board of CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. How is mm. CEPI innovating and collaborating to get vaccines out into the world? And, and how are you making sure that it's available to more vulnerable populations in Australia and outside in the world? So, of course, uh, CEPI was created a little over two years ago to work on epidemic uh, potential uh, pathogens. And as it happened, coronavirus was one of the top three that we identified right at the very beginning and we started investing. And at CEPI, what we've done is we've, with the best scientific advice, funded additional projects. And of course, we know there are many people around the world investing in this. And um, if I'm going to be honest, I don't care who gets there first. I want somebody to get there with a successful vaccine, preferably more than one, actually. Uh, but what we are really concerned about is not only that that work is um, underway, that it's well founded in science, but importantly, that actually the people who are developing vaccines and who will ultimately, we hope, produce vaccines, that they sign on to these equitable access principles. What we don't want is a vaccine nationalism, which sees uh, one country or one geography preferenced if and when there is a vaccine produced. If one part of the world still has this disease running and particularly in vulnerable populations, we all have it. It will affect all of our economies. It will affect travel. It will affect trade. So our objective is to make sure, working with the WHO, our partners at Gavi and a number of others, that essentially the people who are most vulnerable will get the first priority. But this is a hard negotiation. Let's not anybody kid themselves. The pressure that domestic governments will be under to service their whole population before the vulnerable in the rest of the world will be extreme. So it's a fight that we have to really continue uh, to be part of right until we actually satisfy ourselves that those needs are met. CEPI has invested already in several vaccine technologies, and one of its candidates is already going into phase one trials soon. How mm -hmm. has it been possible to get to phase one so quickly? I mean, I, I, I imagine it's, 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 it is as unprecedented for you as it is anyone. Well, if there's one word that I think describes this pandemic, and even the comedians are now joking about it, it's the word unprecedented. So everything about this pandemic is unprecedented, including this amazing work that is going on uh, with science, with manufacturing, with this kind of collaboration. And as you say, vaccines are really complex to produce. Normally they take years and years. Part of the reason for that, of course, is that because they're expensive, you don't want to take a step 
um, which is going to cost you a lot of money until you're confident it's a good investment. Now, what we're doing here is we're truncating all of those steps. We're running things in parallel. We're doing things earlier than we would otherwise because um, if I put it in this kind of language, we're taking a bet. Now, that doesn't mean we're taking a bet on safety and we're not taking a bet on efficacy. But what we're saying is we're prepared to spend some money now. And OK, if we're not right and it doesn't work, that's fine. But if it what it means is we get a vaccine earlier, boy, will that be money that's worth having spent. So it's a, an investment. It's a bet we're prepared to make. And the other thing to remember, of course, is we've got new technology. Um, we're using RNA and DNA. We've got all sorts of different approaches to making vaccines. These are new and novel. Um, we don't have, in some cases, human vaccines that have been licensed using some of these technologies, although we do have animal vaccines. So what we're doing here is leveraging all of the new science that we've got. We're basically squeezing up the process. And some of the platforms technologies that CEPI has funded, we funded specifically with the objective that you would go from uh, the identification of the pathogen that's genetic uh, uh, material to having at least something that could be a candidate in 16 weeks. So again, use that word, unprecedented. You talked about how Australia was affected by SARS years ago. I mean, as you know, the United States has just been so unprepared for this. Um, how much would you say you benefited from having that experience with SARS and did that propel you know the the level of preparedness um, that you deployed when COVID finally struck? Firstly can I just place pay some credit to the United States because and certainly of the colleagues I have worked with over very, very many years. I mean, there are some fantastic scientists in the US and people who take these issues really, really seriously. And the US has been a huge investor and that's been to the, the globe's benefit. So so let's let's understand that there are wonderful people working on these issues in the United States, including your frontline healthcare workers who are just doing an amazing job. Certainly. But I think there is something in proximity and geography that brings issues really home. Now, we didn't actually have SARS in Australia, but we expected to get it at any minute. And you would know that um, SARS was in our time zone. Um, these are in communities that many Australians have visited many, many, many times. So for us, it was um, our friends, our backyard, and potentially imminently in our front yard. So I think for us, it was unbelievably real. And that influenced a whole generation here of public health leaders. It influenced investment and it influenced uh, preparedness. Now, one of the things I think we know is if these experiences for you are, they're real, um, they're things you have been through, you are very sensitised to them. And one of the things about our health leadership is many of those people have had that experience. I think sometimes if you are not a health expert or if you haven't had that experience, it can be sometimes more difficult to appreciate that something that looks like a little blip on the other side of the world is actually about to turn into a global disaster. Jane, finally, the question I think that is on everyone's mind, what do you think it's going to take for us to to get back to a sense of, of, of normalcy? When do you think that will even be possible? So, I mean, I think we need to start by acknowledging that uh, this disease will continue to be a threat until such time as we have a couple of things. Ideally, in the short term, we will make real progress on treatments. And the reality is we have a battery of work going on right around the world, looking at every possible therapy, antiretroviral, but more than that, including clinical treatment for people who are, you know, intensive care. And so let's hope, and we're starting to see um, some indications that some things are proving effective, and that's fantastic. Um, I think if you're going to get this illness uh, a bit like with HIV, uh, we haven't had a vaccine for HIV yet now, but we do have a series of treatments and things that can be done. So it's now basically a chronic disease if you can get access to those treatments. So let's hope that that happens really quickly. But essentially, I mean, a bit like the community lived with polio for many years until such time as there was a vaccine, we will have to change our behaviour. And uh, much as, as when I was a child, we had to learn and really practice hygiene, um, that is one of the things we're going to have to think about and be quite meticulous about. And I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm 60 years old. 
I don't have comorbidities, but I have a higher risk than someone who's younger. And I think the message to all of us is we all have a part to play in protecting everybody in our community, uh, because until such time as we have herd immunity, which let's be honest, is most preferably achieved by having a vaccine, uh, then essentially we're all in the same boat together. So in the short term, great hygiene, thoughtful interaction with others, uh, if you're not well, stay home. Don't go to work. Um, all those steps that we know about, fingers crossed for treatments, and uh, I've got money, my money on a vaccine, and hopefully it won't be too long. Jane Halton, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, and especially thank you for your insights and expertise. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, and uh, my very best wishes to, to all of your viewers. And that was Jane Holton, Australia's former secretary of its Department of Health. So we've been talking about the supply chain on the show and delivery services. They are some of the most taxed resources right now as demand skyrockets. A delayed order of my kid's new paint set is one thing, but when you're talking about delivering vaccines in the middle of a pandemic, it starts to take on a whole new meaning. My next guest is Laura Lane, president of Global Public Affairs at UPS. As an expert and leader in logistics, she's in charge of air and land for 220 countries. She's here to talk about UPS's crucial role in getting supplies where they're needed the most. Laura, welcome to the show. Now, so far, we've been talking about how a manufactured but when these vaccines are available, how do you get them into the world, especially during this time when exports and imports uh, between countries are practically shut down and there are fewer flights and fewer ships at sea? So tell me about the unique challenges that you're dealing with now in the wake of COVID. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about um, all that UPS has been doing at the start of this uh, pandemic. I will share with you that we've been operating throughout uh, this whole crisis because we knew we had a special responsibility and an obligation to make sure we keep kept delivering anywhere and everywhere around the world. And so um, at the beginning of this crisis, when it started out in China, we learned a lot of lessons very quickly about what it was going to take to help to contain uh, the virus and how we could play a leading role in helping the rest of the world. And so uh, the first and foremost, what was a top priority for us was keeping our people safe. People see our, our package cars and our trucks and our airplanes everywhere, but what really matters is our people. So first and foremost, we knew we had to instantly make sure that we were protecting our people as we were asking them to come to work every day. And so it was a great priority for us to make sure that they understood how they could keep themselves safe on the job, as well as providing them with all the PPE that they would need to stay safe and instituted all the cleaning protocols and the extra guidelines about how they would do their jobs a little bit differently. Um, and then next, we worked with governments and we um, stressed to all of them that if they were going to win this war on uh, the virus, logistics was going to be essential. And that meant it was essential that our package cars, our tractor trailers, and our airplanes had to keep moving around the world in all 220 countries and territories so we could get that those critical supplies from wherever they were in the world to wherever they were needed in the world. And so we've seen in our trade lanes a lot of reversals. In the outbreak of the crisis, we were bringing a lot of supplies into Asia. Now we've reversed a lot of those supply chains and are bringing a lot of supplies to Europe, to the United States, and to other parts of the world. And no matter where it was in the world, we flexed our network, we adapted, and we deployed the resources that we had on hand to be able to move uh, products swiftly through customs onto the next mode of transportation that was needed to deliver it just in time anywhere and everywhere in the world. So for us, we were part of the air bridge, which the United States government set up, as well as similar kinds of air operations that identified where sources of supply for critical PPE, respirators, masks, any of the specialized um, hospital gowns or any of the specialized kinds of uh, uh, supplies needed to be able to stand up testing centers, to be able to help those who had contracted the virus, 
to get those just-in-time supplies to where they were needed. Uh, getting back to vaccines and, and, and this effort to get them around the world, Ramo was talking about uh, how they have to be kept at a certain temperature. Um, yeah. Are you starting to plan for how vaccines are going to uh, get distributed even before a vaccine has been approved? I was going to share, we've got these capabilities already built into UPS. We have 5,500 healthcare professionals. We have the capabilities already to move all kinds of vaccines around the world. We've been on the front lines of a lot of important efforts. Think about the Ebola crisis. We were on the front lines in helping to address that crisis. We've been on the front lines of the HIV efforts. We've been distributing vaccines from, you know, the traditional ones that are needed to keep the ch children safe around the world. We've got the capabilities to already do that. So we have the cold chains that capabilities that allow us to pick up from centers that have a variety of vaccines, move them temperature controlled in special storage containers around the world and be able to deliver them just in time. So it's just a matter of when the vaccines are ready we will be ready to deliver them wherever they're needed around the world. And we have the capabilities, we have the extensive network that will allow us to do that no matter where in the world um, those vaccines are needed. And we have the capabilities to pick them up from wherever they are produced in the world. I will share, in fact, that we're also involved in a lot of clinical trials already involving vaccines that are under development as well as treatments. And so we're already moving, um, you know, a variety of uh, supplies and um, specimens through our um, network to be able to help in the development of accelerating the development of those vaccines. Our objective is take the time and, and Laura, complexity. Did I, did, I, did, I, did I hear that you're also using drones to deliver as well? Yes. We are trying to figure out as many different innovations as possible in the logistics space. So we may deliver through per traditional package cars, um, but we're also looking at using drones to deliver a variety of um, essential needs. So in Rwanda, for example, we've already partnered with uh, Gave, the Vaccine Alliance, to do deliveries across the country of Rwanda using drones. We've recently just expanded that capability to Ghana and are now serving over 2,000 healthcare facilities in the country of Ghana and looking to expand it to Nigeria. Here closer to home in the United States, we just recently did a really amazing um, test with CVS and uh, made drone deliveries in a part of Florida called The Villages that has um, a high number of senior citizens who would um, you know, benefit from being able to get deliveries by drones, especially since we want to keep them safer and not going out and about, especially while we're abiding by these stay-at-home guidelines. Drone deliveries are the perfect solution for those kinds of um, activities. That's amazing. I have a question from Dr. Gaythree Devi from LinkedIn. He asks, are there any specific supply chain strategies that may be involved in distribution to the vulnerable populations across the globe? Yeah, so UPS has a, a great um, background in terms of humanitarian logistics and in the course of setting up a variety of depots around the world, we know how quickly we can get essential supplies from these depots to anywhere in the world. And so we are working with governments right now to help them stand up additional stockpiles so that from those stockpiles or those depots, we can more quickly move product to um, parts of the world that may not have their own capabilities to, for example, um, develop masks or create masks or uh, have the ventilators on hand, or in the case of the vaccines or the needs of the testing kits, being able to um, get the capabilities developed in certain parts of the world and then move them quickly to other parts that may not have those uh, capabilities in their countries. So we do have uh, the development of that kind of network around the world that we're ready to deploy to be able to help. In the case of vaccines, we have capabilities uh, of specialized warehouses in Europe, in Asia, and in the United States from which we're ready to deploy uh, vaccines as they become available. Well, that's
services UPS provides go far beyond uh, pickup. In fact, I, I understand that UPS has been helping states set up COVID-19 testing centers in school and retail parking lots. Is this something new for the company? And, and how do you manage the logistics around that? You know, I was going to say, we um, we haven't been in the business of setting up testing centers in parking lots um, and schools, and so that was a new location. But in terms of setting up testing capabilities, we've done it in other ways for other kinds of need, meeting other kinds of needs. But in this case, we were asked uh, specifically by the U.S. government and also by other governments around the world to help set up these rapid testing centers. And uh, we were involved in getting the essential supplies to those testing centers, setting up the tents, uh, getting all the protective gear for those who are going to be taking the tests, uh, it taking the tests of uh, individuals driving by, and then getting the samples and quickly getting them sent back to the labs for processing. But a cool new development that we're a part of right now is uh, accelerating the process of home testing. So we're going to be involved in getting test kits sent to people's homes, having them do the tests on themselves, um, and then picking up those test kits from their homes and getting them quickly back to the labs. And so that's a new innovation so that if people feel more comfortable taking a, a COVID-19 test in their homes, we'll be able to stand up that capability um, in partnership with um, Everlywell, for example, which is going to be rolling out these at-home test kits. We're also, like I said, helping in those situations where people want to go to a location and be tested. We're making sure that all those testing centers, wherever they are, are stocked with the supplies that they need. The healthcare workers have what they need, and those samples are being uh, picked up quickly and delivered to the labs so that everybody gets their results just in time or sooner if possible. Now, the notion of home testing certainly does seem like a, a, a very welcome development. You mentioned uh, when we first started talking about how your first priority was uh, protecting your employees, and it's amazing to me that you all didn't stop down at all. So, how did you go about? protecting your thousands and thousands of employees around the world? You know, I will tell you that um, we have 495,000 employees around the world and every one of them are heroes um, because it took a lot of courage for them to um, continue providing our service throughout this pandemic. And um, what we did is we made sure they knew that the company saw them as our first priority. We made sure they were given regular, in fact, daily briefings on how they could keep themselves safe. We provided them the PPE um, when, it, uh, when uh, we learned that it would make them safer if they wore masks while they were um, uh, in the middle of their daily work. We ensured that there was uh, regular hand sanitizing in all of the operations, extra cleaning protocols, um, anything we could do to make them safer um, and, and help them know what it was that they could do to keep themselves safe, we instituted um, as part of our processes. We ensured uh, that there was uh, you know, social distancing or six feet of separation. We altered our work protocols so that people could keep doing their job but keep that distance be it when they you know, punched in for work or they were on the lines loading the packages onto the conveyors or into the package cars. Um, we also changed some of our processes so that our obligation is not only to keep our people safe, but also to deliver safely in our communities. And so um, we changed some of the processes for delivering packages so that signatures wouldn't be required physically. We found alternative methods to be able to, you know, verify age um, or other protocols when signatures were required. But whatever it took, we made sure that um, we communicated uh, what was essential in terms of keeping everyone healthy and, and safe, and we provided them the supplies that they needed in order to keep delivering. And um, I think it's worked. I mean, our, our uh, UPSers aren't immune to the, to the virus, but um, we have um, ensured that we have kept them as safe as possible. I will also add that we took another step, and that was when um, 
when an employee might have a temperature, um, you know, uh, we, we ask them to uh, self uh, take their temperatures at home. And if they weren't feeling well, to uh, let us know that. And we actually provided extra benefits to our employees so that they wouldn't be incentivized to come to work if they weren't feeling well. We wanted them to stay home and seek um, medical you know, advice uh, in terms of whatever their condition was. And all of these practices and protocols, I think, allowed us to keep delivering um, and delivering great service throughout this pandemic because we knew people were counting on us. So there are so many companies who should take a page from how you have handled this. Laura Lane from UPS, thank you so much for being with us today. It is truly remarkable to think about how many steps are on the road to a vaccine and how many people must join each other on that road. So far, our guests this week are all making a large scale impact, often at a global scale. But this next story reminds us all that no matter our age, one person can make a difference. Check out this incredible and inspiring story of a young woman who decided to do what she could for her own community. So, hi everyone. My name is Tomi Sinadefari from Nigeria. I'll be talking about the recent sensitization project I carried out on COVID-19. In a developing country like Nigeria, where the bulk of the food people consume comes from the local market, which is always crowded due to high traffic and social interaction among the people. The number of infected persons are gradually increasing and if care is not taken, this virus can spread rapidly among the people. As part of my social responsibility and in order to contain the spread of the virus, I mobilized a few friends and also wrote to some organizations for collaboration in order to raise awareness about the COVID-19 preventive measures. We were able to donate nose masks, hand sanitizer, tap buckets and other PPEs to the market and also individually to the people in the market. We were able to sensitize them about the preventive measures of COVID-19 and also demonstrated the proper hand washing techniques to the people. We made a banner in which we wrote the preventive measures of COVID-19 in their local language and placed it at a strategic place in the market for people to always read and also we included the outline in case of emergency. I believe it is our social responsibility as individuals to ensure the virus doesn't spread among the people. Our individual efforts can make an immeasurable impact in the life of many people. Thank you. That was a beautiful example of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Please keep submitting your questions at jnj.com slash road to a vaccine, and we'll be answering more Tuesday next week on another live episode. We'll also have a chance to talk with J&J's Dr. Paul Stoffels live about the critical role of global collaboration uh, in, an, in an effort to get such a large amount of vaccines out there to the public. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us, and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week.